Hey everybody, welcome back to One Mic, and today I'm here to talk about Season 3, Episode 2 of Paramount Plus's Mayor of Kingstown, titled Guts. Uh, since I'm now hyper aware of titles, when I saw this one, I was Im immediately curious about why I was given that name and what would happen in the episode to justify it. <laughs> I wasn't disappointed, but <laughs> I will say this, the title takes on... Uh, added meaning for me beyond Carney's little little slip inside scene. Uh, I think the episode itself took a lot of guts to make because it sets an expectation that's going to be tough for the show to meet. And, and not that I don't think it's capable. It's just going to be tough. And But they, they, this show kind of sets itself up in this way every season. Uh, this was a really good episode. And it progressed and set up a lot of cool and interesting plot lines. But maybe too many? And I mean, and, and again, every season they kind of do this where I'm just like, can you handle all of these plot lines? Can you wrap all of these up at the end of the season? And I think by and large, the show does manage. Uh, I, just, I think this uh, specific episode did a great job of juggling all of those things. But I mean, it's going to be a difficult task to uh, continue to do this week in and week out. But I will say this. Not only do I think this show is capable of juggling this many plot lines and character arcs and themes, but I expect it to. And I honestly really look forward to watching what happens because this episode did a lot to set up what looks to be a really exciting season. Uh, I'm going to again structure my coverage as a whole in this video as I did with last, last week's video. Just kind of going over uh, each plot line or character theme that is explored uh, in this episode and what I think worked, what I think didn't, and why. Uh, I also think this episode had a couple of really good and poignant moments that I was honestly surprised to see here. I don't really think of this show in that regard, and, and, and again, that could be a failing of mine, but there were a couple of really good slash moving scenes in this episode that were a lot more subtle than good scenes tend to be on this show, and I thought they both worked really well, uh, but I'll get to those in a little bit. I'm going to start with the main focus of this episode, and that's the uh, the bad drugs plot line that we see. Uh, bad drugs get smuggled into the prison while Mike does this kind of voiceover at the beginning about how prison wears on both the prisoner and their family on the outside. And, and just a, a, a brief side tangent here. I do believe that to be true, that it wears on both parties, but it's not like a, like, they, like the show almost presented it kind of like a one-to-one. -one. Like they're dealing with their thing and we're dealing with an equal different thing on the outside. And yes, those of us on the outside go through a lot as it pertains to our loved ones who are on the inside, but I would never dream of, it, it feels like downplaying the experiences of the people on the inside by trying to make them comparable to mine on the outside. Like, I never say, man, we going through it out here too, man. Like, <laughs> what did it say? Because it feels disrespectful to the way we're going through it <laughs> that they're experiencing on the inside. And maybe that's just me, but that voiceover almost felt like it was downplaying the experiences on the inside and elevating the ones on the outside to make the two experiences comparable, and they aren't. Hey everybody, I just want to take a small break from this review to talk about the various other ways you can engage with me on other platforms. If you're so inclined, uh, and I understand why you wouldn't, I am an acquired taste, but you can join the Patreon where you can get extra content like retro reviews where I review old shows and movies to see if they still hold up today, Mike's Musings where I talk about shows I'm watching that I don't cover on the channel, or Mike's VOD where you can commission me to watch a show which I will then review on the channel. And if you want to engage with me and chat with me more directly, I also implore you to join the Discord and follow the Facebook page. I set up channels in the Discord for all of us to discuss the shows I'm reviewing on the channel. And I also drop new videos in there since it's the easiest platform for me to share to from my phone. The Facebook can be really fun because I sort of live comment on shows I'm watching, often while under the influence, I'm not going to lie. And I'll also share news there, both about television and film and about myself as well. So if you like my content, you want to be more engaged, you think I'm charming, or you simply want to show support, feel free to sign up for the Patreon or join the Discord or Facebook today. Links to all platforms are in every video description. Remember to share all my shit to your respective social media platforms. And now back to this review. Anyway, uh, a prisoner in Bun Bunny's crew smuggles in some drugs that he eats out of a chip bag that ultimately end up killing him. Drugs explode in his body. It's explode. The bag breaks in his body. <laughs> <laughs> the drugs is like, what kind of drugs is this? <laughs> okay, the bag breaks in his body. 
and it kills him as well as several other inmates and people on the outside. Why did drugs that killed one man by rupturing inside of him kill a bunch of other prisoners? Well, I'm glad you asked. <coughs> Raph, who is now, if you recall, has kind of like taken over Bunny's place in the prison. He couldn't abide by still not selling the drugs, so they cut the drugs out of the inmate anyway and sold them. His guts being on the floor is how Carney ended up looking like, <laughs> looking like me trying to ice skate. <laughs> uh, but we learned the drugs have been cut with a cocktail of other shit, but we don't know uh, with what, why, or by who just yet. But there's a massive fallout from this. The woman who smuggled the drugs in, her name is Sharon, and she's someone who Bunny trusted. She works for him. And he seemed unbothered by the one guy dying, kind of like, yeah, just what it is. That's, that's how it works here. Um, but once other people started dying, Sharon's called into question when she can't be reached and she later turns up dead. And again, we don't know why or by who, but it felt to me like Sharon's death was like the cleaning up of loose ends. Uh, this also leads to one of the two subtly great scenes I mentioned earlier. Mike and Ian go to the home of Sharon's brother. And side note on this, how shitty of a cop is Ian <laughs> to drive by that place and say that it seemed abandoned? <laughs> I think as a cop, he would know that when you're dealing <laughs> when you're dealing with drug dealers, <laughs> seeming abandoned is kind of the point. <laughs> it's supposed to it's not supposed to look <laughs> look like an active drug house, Ian. <laughs> anyway. Uh, Mike calls out how, st how stupid that is. And then they go to the house and Sharon's brother is in fact there. It seemed abandoned, but it wasn't. Uh, he doesn't give up any info of value, but when they tell him that Sharon's dead, he breaks down briefly. And then he grabs his trusty spoon and rolls up his sleeve, wraps his arm <laughs> as Mike and Ian just quietly walk out of the door and leave him to it. And that was a really sad scene to me because it, it, it speaks to the lives of people in that city and the role that Ian and Mike play within it. Like there was a, like a, a why even bother trying to stop this kind of feel to that moment that was really heavy to me. Like that guy in that moment within like that same night, he might OD and die. And Mike and Ian are just kind of like, he's going through it. He's going to do it regardless. Happens all the time here. Why even bother? Like th their walking out was very much a like, it doesn't even matter what we do here. And that was really sad. Uh, that, that you could convey a scene, especially when you could convey a scene like that without much dialogue. Uh, it's also in this sequence of scenes that Mike learns from Ian about Constantine, the, the guy from last week who, who created a new Batman. Uh, so we'll see what happens with Constantine uh, in the future. Anyway, Bunny, who is not at all concerned when it was just the one guy, is now <laughs> understandably concerned. Uh, I love the moment when he's on the phone with Mike and Mike's like, I'm going to fix it. But you can't. But you can't bitch about it later. And Bunny is like, I'm having deja vu, Mike. I don't get. I don't like it. And like, yeah, like last time you said that you were gonna fix something, and Bunny can't complain about it later. Bunny was in prison for the whole season, so I definitely get why Bunny would be having deja vu. Uh, but Mike ends up telling Raph to make a deal with a rival gang in the prison, any gang, uh, to get some clean supply out there. Uh, Ralph mentions in this scene that he doesn't trust Mike like Bunny does and gives him kind of like this mean look as he's leaving. And part of me went, ooh, I wonder what's going to come of that, if anything. And then another part of me was like, there's no point or reason for Ralph to have a problem with Mike. So that felt really forced. Um, but that kind of wraps up the bad drug storyline for this episode. But my uh, there is no point <laughs> statement within the last uh uh, sentence is a good segue into talking about Iris because it's Iris. Um, I really, truly hate Iris. Like, truthfully, why is she still on the show? She never gets anything of interest to do. At least she hasn't since season one. And when she does, it's always have something, have Iris do something implausibly stupid so that she can bring unnecessary and additional chaos into Mike's life. And that's it. She just seems like chaos for Mike personified, which would possibly be fine if there weren't already a bunch of other really interesting and fleshed out problems for Mike. Why do we have to give him anything at all extra to worry about, let alone something they're not going to flesh out beyond he inexplicably cares for this shitty character, so whatever the fuck she's got going on matters to him. Like, that's the, that's the biggest motivation behind having Mike involved in an Iris plotline. Like, Iris herself is a stupid character. And when I say that, I mean both in her use within the show and the character itself. Like the character of Iris is stupid as within the context of the show, 
But then with outside of the I'm sorry, within yeah, as in like Iris within the show is stupid. But the character of Iris and her use on the show is also stupid. So like Iris was pulled over for running a stop sign and the cop learns that she also doesn't have a license. Where does she get off getting indignant with the cop? Like she's being mistreated. Like, yeah, sure, running a stop sign, that's not a huge deal. Either let her go with a warning or give her a ticket, fine. It's so insignificant that I thought in that moment that the cop was like dirty and was working for someone and was gonna kill or abduct Iris. And that was still giving me an Iris plotline way more credit than it deserved because they didn't even do any of that. She's just a poorly written character who makes inexplicably bad decisions. Like she tries to drive away from the cop and then starts fighting back with him. And I'm just like, this is so stupid and contrived just because they were like, well, we got to write something into the script for Iris to fuck up Mike's life. But they didn't try. They didn't do anything good. You don't have to do that. And every time I see Iris, it's like she's being forced on us because they've barely put in any effort into writing something for her. Like something interesting for her, I should say. And interesting isn't even the bar. Like just write something for her that doesn't make me hate her and make it obvious that you're forcing her onto us. And why? Like, she, she's not a good character. You're clearly not putting any effort into making her one. The actress isn't somebody that you're like, well, we got her, we got to use her. Like, there's no point to this character. Like, it's just baffling to me how shitty and useless of a character she is on this show. Now Mike is going to have to worry about whatever the fuck she's gotten herself into, and they didn't even bother to make it interesting or plausible for that character or write... Like, it felt like they were just like, yeah, just put some shit in there for Iris. And it's like, you don't need to have her on the show. The show has eight... This show has so many different things going on. You don't need to force any one thing on any of us at all. If Iris is shitty and boring and dumb and useless and pointless, which she is, kill the character and get off the show. Make it tighter. Make it better. Don't... Don't, like, force feed these shitty Iris plot points into these episodes that bring nothing they don't they don't add anything they just further complicate mike's already complicated life and we don't need an iris plot line in order for his life to already be excessively complicated fortunately even though the iris stuff was shitty it did get the least amount of screen time in this episode so that's a good thing uh, one of the other main stories in this uh, episode involved a new character played by Paula Malcolmson who has played unlikable characters or like 800 million different things. She's like a great... <laughs> she's like... She's not like Walton Goggins, but like how Walton Goggins can kind of like... Like you can depend on him to be Walton Goggins in anything. Like Paula Malcolmson is going to come in and play this kind of role in like 800 different things, but she'll be great at it. Uh, she comes to Mike because the guy who killed her son is about to be paroled. Apparently they were friends. This guy killed her son during an argument, then mourned and cried with her as if he didn't do it. Uh, and she wants Mike to find a way to keep this guy in prison. But Mike finds out he's been a model prisoner and that the parole has already gone through and this guy is already free. Uh, near the end of the episode, she pays Mike anyway for his trouble, but then she kills the guy herself. Now, this plot line has no connection to anything else on the show, which is kind of weird to me. Uh, I'm not saying that it won't, it probably will tie in, but this feels very outside of everything else that's going on. Whereas everything else that's going on feels kind of like tangentially connected to the bad drugs plot line. This feels t entirely separate. Now that she's killed this guy, that could be the start of the tie in, but I'm already finding myself wondering how or if this is going to matter or if it's just going to be some weird little side thing that Mike has to deal with along with Iris. I think more so than the act of killing this guy, this plot line ties more in with Mike's character development. So uh, she brings up his mom a lot in this episode and asks about what happened to the person who killed Mitch. Then later, when Kyle calls Mike to tell him that Iris is missing, he gives Mike shit for not having come to visit the baby yet. And at the end of the episode, Mike does start to come visit, but then he bails and then he, <laughs> he goes to get the pussy instead. <laughs> You gotta love him. You gotta love men, right? <laughs> you gotta love us. I think it's pretty clear that Mike is struggling to cope with the loss of his mother uh, and how that ties in. Not, not ties in, but like it ties in to who Mike is or Mike's character development. Uh, it ties in with the loss of his brother too. And I guess he probably he's probably uh, seeing himself as someone who brings like death to his family with his presence. Like that's my guess. Like he, he's not visiting the baby because he's like, uh, you know, I promised... Uh, my mom that I wouldn't get Kyle hurt or killed or whatever. 
now she's dead. Uh, you know, I, 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 you know, I've allowed Mitch to die. He, he, he probably wouldn't verbalize that, but that's probably how he feels. And now he's looking like if I bring myself, you know, into this baby's life, I could get that baby killed. Or I could end up breaking the promise that I made to our mother by getting Kyle killed. So that's what I think they're going for. Uh, I think that's a bit overdone of a theme. I, like that idea of like uh, me being around could get other people killed. That, that like I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna even change that. That's an overdone thing. <laughs> I'm gonna remove uh, I think and a bit. That's an overdone theme in in television and film. But I'm not uninterested in seeing what Mayor Kingstown's gonna do with it. Uh, speaking of Mike not going to visit this kid, I really like the scene where Robert and his wife did go visit the kid. Like for starters, it says a lot that Robert came to visit before Mike did. But I also liked how Kyle mentioned wanting to join SWAT. And Robert's like, when you're in the shit, you either get too angry or you're too afraid and that'll get you and your team killed. And it's like, that was tough to hear, but I love the straight talk from friend to friend. Like that's, that's a unique dynamic, even amongst men, to have that very very dry just like here is my advice to you and not even acknowledge like you may not want to hear it but it's just like i'm your friend i'm going to give you my advice and my thoughts straight up dry with no emotion or anything like that take it how you will but you know that it's coming from a good place and that i think was re conveyed really really well in that scene and and that, that is how how mature men handle that sort of thing it'd be like you're not gonna like me I think that the best example is is when men see their male friends doing something that they shouldn't do as it pertains to their wife or significant other. Like, yes, you'll have some friends who will just like look the other way, but then you'll have some friends who will be like, you know, this is a stupid fucking decision to cheat on your wife with so-and-so or whatever. And and that's how we talk to each other if we are true friends and uh, we're, give, we're giving out that tough love. Uh, and, and Robert didn't even sugarcoat it. It was like, Kyle needs to hear this, so here it is. And I just thought that was a really good scene. And I thought it was an accurate convey, convey it, an accurate portrayal, conveyal, what the fuck? An accurate portrayal of how two mature men handle having to give some kind of like tough love advice. And it was the first, it was, it, this is the first time I, I've seen Robert in the scene. And I'm, and I'm like, what? he's not a like terribly contrived, brutish, dumb character. So like, that was kind of cool. Uh, I still don't know what the plan is for Kyle this season, uh, but they're setting up so much stuff as they always do that maybe we'll understand more about Kyle's arc next week. Uh, another thing I liked with this seemingly irrelevant plot line with, with, <laughs> with Ray Donovan's wife <laughs> was showing me a bit of attention to detail. I have to say it's the little things that make the difference between a good show and a great one. And I liked how they handled Mike's quest to find information on her son's killer or friend or both. What it's not, there's no or. He's both the friend and killer. Uh, they could have just had Mike deliver the information about him being a model prisoner being released. Like, yeah, I looked into it. Uh, he's being a model prisoner and the parole's already gone through. There's nothing I can do. But they gave us that one quick scene of Mike calling Carney. And going, hey, you still got that sister that works at Stonebrook? Can you get me in touch with her? And it's like a small moment, I know, but it spoke to the level of connections that Mike has. And it speaks to how he operates and how he works. And that makes Mike and the show feel more realistic by providing those little specks of detail. Like, I like that. I didn't need it, but I like that it was there. Because Mike gets, Mike gets given so many requests, or asked, I'm sorry, so many requests of people, all different types of requests... And it's interesting to see how he works with these kinds of requests when he's not a cop and he's not affiliated with the prison. He's just a regular fucking civilian. How does how is he going to handle now this situation? But it's because of all the connections that he has. So I don't know. I, it, it was two sentences, but I thought like that was a cool little bit of detail. Uh, there is still not one, but two more subplots in this episode <laughs> left for me to discuss. Uh, I'm only going to talk about them briefly because the episode itself doesn't spend too much time on them, but they can end up being a focal point next week, just like Constantine was a big focus last week, and then we don't see him at all this week. So uh, Kareem and Carney are at each other's throats, and Carney gets busted down to digging through shit after he says what we went through <laughs> in reference to last season's riot. <laughs> like, we're not going to talk about what Kareem went through. You guys know what Kareem went through last season. I understand why he... <laughs> Why he was upset about Carney kind of looping himself into all that. Uh, Kareem dealing with PTSD from the riot is kind of a, a carryover from last season. So I'd like to see that evolve into something else. Maybe he starts to become a problem for people. Uh, and then lastly, Merle, the guy who got himself transferred after he presumably found out about Robert blowing up that meth house. Uh, he has one of the Aryan guys killed right in front of his daughter. 
Uh, still don't know where that's going either, but I am interested. Uh, so all in all, I thought this was a really good episode. I thought it set up some really uh, interesting stuff. This looks like it's going to be another really exciting season. Uh, so let me know what you thought in the comments. And until next week, peace.